Thus Imam Hussein, because they had listened and heard the stories, the narrations of Karbala for three years. All they wanted was that. And when it happened, the tears that Assalamu alaikum. Imam Hussein TV wishes the well being and safety of all its viewers. Please be cautious and. Winter has arrived in Afghanistan. And in the evenings and nights, temperatures reach up to minus 15 degrees Celsius. Our brothers and sisters struggle during these cold months to keep warm. Their houses are inadequate to keep the heat in, and poverty makes it harder to keep warm. Many will get ill, and some won't survive to see spring. IHDRF is determined to help. $150 is all it takes to provide heating for one household for the whole winter. That's $150 for four months worth of heating. We will provide each household with fuel that they can burn throughout the winter, helping each household to look after their most vulnerable and allowing their loved ones to keep warm. Visit www.ihdrf.org to spread the warmth. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh, dear respected brothers and sisters, dear viewers of Imam Hussein TV across the globe, wherever you may be, and a warm welcome to you all to this live Q&A session where over the past four nights, hundreds of thousands of views, tens of thousands of calls, messages, emails have been coming in by you wanting your questions answered by the Sayyid. Inshallah tonight, we'll be taking in your questions and our social media team have looked at the diversity of the calls, messages and emails coming in. And you, the dear viewers, have come from over 124 different countries calling, messaging and emailing in. Now, inshallah, I won't take up too much of your time, but this is something that doesn't happen usually outside of Muharram. We don't usually see that many views happening outside of the period of Muharram, but this is exactly what's happened here at Imam Hussein TV. But without further ado, I'm your host, Minhal Al-Khafaji, with Dr. Sayyid Amman Naqshwani. Sayyidna, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. very well, thank you. Alhamdulillah. Now Sayyidna, I'm sure you'd agree with me that I and many of the viewers out there, when we look at Fatimiyyah, it's never been gone into the depth that you've gone into these past four nights. No one's really looked at it from the angles that you've come up with. And there's so many people that have asked so many questions, historical, theological, social, all of these questions. But Sayyidina, let's get right into it. Um, the first question says, Salaamu Alaikum Sayyidina, your lecture on the Lady of Heaven film made some good points, but the directors and producers are people with a checkered past. Surely you would take such a thing on board when recommending to or not watch such a film. What was your intention from such an analysis? Well, first and foremost, um, a big thank you goes to the team behind the scenes for their fantastic work. Let's not forget we would never have achieved the success if it wasn't for the great work of those behind the scenes, mm -hmm. uh, the cameramen, the producers, and so on. In terms of the film The Lady of Heaven, I cannot deny what the questioner uh, is saying when they point to the fact that there are personalities who are associated with the film where there may be question marks without a doubt about some of the statements they've made. Mm -hmm. And there is no way that on my part 
I necessarily agree mm -hmm. with even the world view of those who are behind the film in terms of the way, for example, they may look at scholars. Mm -hmm. Some of them may have, for example, in the past been known to insult some of our grand scholars and that certainly is not something which I have ever been or will ever be a proponent of. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, at times I grew up in a generation where there were wars between groups associated yeah. with different scholars. And I don't want to see that in the generation to come. Sure. So when somebody tells me that, yes, there are people who are associated with the film The Lady of Heaven, mm -hmm. who have certain statements or have a certain way of speaking mm -hmm. that they differ with, yes, I differ with that as well. Mm -hmm. I won't deny that. Uh, but my main point in giving the lecture about the film was more to do with the fact that I felt that even if somebody else was directing this film, mm -hmm. or if somebody else was making a film about Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam's life, yep. I felt that we were still going to be too apologetic, mm -hmm. okay. and that we were still going to, in a way, withdraw Mm -hmm. from support for a film on the biography of Fatima al zahra alayhi salam. Yeah. So I know that a lot of people have gone on the tangent where they've said that we don't support such a film because of the people who are associated with it. Okay, I can understand that. Yeah. At the end of the day, no one's going to force anyone um, to watch this film. And I'm sure there are even films in different languages where we may differ with the directors who are involved. Sure. But say there was going to be a film produced about the life and the martyrdom of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, would you still have a problem with a film coming or being released if it was from a different group of directors and producers? Good point. My issue was that I felt that we still haven't evolved to a level where we are confident about our narrative Mm. and have the readiness to have our narrative out there. Mm -hmm. I felt that there is still too much of an apologetic Shiism, yeah. which in some cases may be valid, by the way, because I do believe that while we live in the UK, you may release a film like this in the UK or the US or Canada or Australia, it won't necessarily have the same backlash that it could have when such a film reaches, for example, Pakistan. Okay. So I can appreciate when some people say that such a film or any film on Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam because of certain incidents mm -hmm. towards the end of her life, I can understand when some people say there's no need to make a film. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, in Pakistan, some people may be attacked mm -hmm. simply when this film is viewed. But also at the same time, I ask myself the question, I think people have to ask themselves the question, that why are we afraid to have our narrative out there of this lady's glorious life? Forget this particular production. Let's just say this production is one you completely disagree with because of who the directors are. We have our differences in some cases with those directors. They may not lose sleep that I have a difference. I may not lose sleep that they may have a difference with me. Mm -hmm. But when I saw A, people straight away, without watching the film, straight away condemning. Yeah. Yep. Relax. Big relax. Thing. Straight away condemnation without having even watched it. Mm -hmm. Straight away there's a condemnation, sometimes being condemned by the very people who've had majalis on Fatima al-Zahra or organized majalis on Fatima al-Zahra in the Fatima period for many years. You raised us on Fatima and now all of a sudden you're saying that when a film comes out mm -hmm. about Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, all of a sudden you're saying to us that, oh, no, condemn it. Then why don't you stop Fatimiyya? Stop Fatimiyya. Because you're kidding yourself mm -hmm. if you think that non-Shia 
haven't got a clue what we believe happened to Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. You're kidding yourself. Exactly. We live in a world where the internet can go anywhere, to any majlis, absolutely anywhere. Yeah. And then it will broadcast that here is a majlis, for example, in Arabic, in Farsi, in Urdu, in English. Mm -hmm. Why don't you scrap Fatimiyyah altogether? Because you don't want sectarian tension, so let's stop Fatimiyyah altogether. Mm -hmm. My point therefore wasn't about who the ones are who are behind the film okay my point was why are the shia always getting so apologetic mm -hmm. a person may have a 30 part series on the life of somebody like omar ibn al-khattab mm -hmm. we remember a few shahar ramadans ago yeah there was a 30 part series on his life no one was apologetic people were proud or making a 30-part series on his life. Mm. Why can I, therefore, not have a film on the life of someone who I revere? You have your literature, I have my literature. Mm -hmm. Your literature presents to you what's happened in Islamic history in one way. My literature deserves to have a voice. Mm -hmm. Enough of this complex of being bullied. If you come to me from an angle of saying that something like this may cause sectarianism, you're living in a world now where everything that's lectured on is available for people to hear. No longer do people not know what our Shia believe. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows what our Shia beliefs are. Mm -hmm. Everybody now knows. And so why not allow for our history to be made clear mm -hmm. into a film? As long as the hope, as I've said, I've not seen the film. Yeah. Um, as long as the hope is there that there isn't aside to this whole production where there is condescending comments made, snide remarks, mm -hmm. attacks, but rather here is the confrontation that takes yeah. place. Here's the life of Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. Let the world see it. Those who want to believe it can believe it. Those who want to see it can see it. Now that's the reason, now, that's one of the reasons I put that question as the first one because um, I've had so many questions. The this, this same question came up time and time again on the WhatsApp that why is the, you know, why is he recommending it? Is he not recommending it? Um, but Sayyidna, the next question says, Salaamu Alaikum Sayyidna um, from the Philippines. Why did you decide to be so open on what is clearly a tense subject, knowing the sectarian ramifications that may ensue? Couldn't you have just discussed Fatima's knowledge or bravery or something related to the world today? Well, firstly, that's not my... You know, it's not my first Fatima that I've lectured. Yeah. You know, and um, if you want previous Fatimiyas, they're available. You could see all my different majalis on different angles of the life of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. Mm -hmm. But I think at the same time, there is no harm a person picking a series mm -hmm. where they're able to discuss exactly what the Shi'i narrative is. Yeah. Now, a person can decide to believe it or they can decide to reject it. But I did begin to notice in our own communities that even people from amongst our own Shia were now beginning to raise questions such as where was Imam Ali alayhi salam, hence the question Imam Ali, or were there doors at the time, or how could the Arabs do that to the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and so on and so forth. And so I just felt that, well, here it is, it's the period of Fatimiyyah, mm -hmm. I'm going to discuss this. I don't think that people out there who are non-Shia didn't know that we believe in this particular narrative. They all knew. But normally what tended to happen was a number of Shia speakers would think twice about, for example, mentioning certain names and so on. But I think in 2020, there's no harm giving your narrative and people can reject it and people can accept it. Now, just before we continue, I want to apologize to the dear viewers because the questions are coming. There's so many questions coming in right now, so I might be on a question and then... It will skip to another question, so do bear with us, and we do apologize if we do not answer your question. But Sayyidna, uh, this next question says, Salaamu Alaikum from Belgium. Uh, do you believe that the incident of the door is believed in all Shi'i circles? Maybe doubted now more so than ever before? Oh no, there's definitely Shi'a who don't believe um, in the martyrdom of Fatima al-Zahra mm -hmm. um, They do exist. Uh, some of them probably are doing taqiyya within Shi'ism, which is quite crazy that you do taqiyya as a Shia from Shia. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe that there are, there are some who, um, who are affected by different reasons for not believing. Mm -hmm. I think some who are not married to Shia yeah. um, certainly don't want the story to have happened. That might affect their marriage. Uh, 
I think some who have business partners who are not Shia yeah. prefer that the story didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I think some who maybe have an inclination um, towards non-Shia thought, it really emerges mm -hmm. um, in their beliefs surrounding this area. Mm -hmm. I think there are some who have plausible questions, mm -hmm. but without necessarily having had the prerequisites to know how to dissect Islamic history, theology, and the literature associated with it. Mm -hmm. So all of us may, for example, question a certain issue yeah. within a particular field, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that we know the prerequisites of how you reach a conclusion regarding that particular issue. So I sometimes may find someone who may have a question mark raised about a certain Islamic legal opinion. And so when they have the question mark raised about an Islamic legal opinion, they're like, oh, what does Ayatollah Sistani, for example, mean when he says something like this? I, I, it's not rationally making sense to me. Mm -hmm. But do you have the prerequisites to understand how Islamic law works? How you derive rulings? Uh, what is the different methods in which a person approaches a hadith or a piece of literature. So you have some people as well who don't know the development of, for example, Islamic historical literature. Yep. And they hear arguments from different people. And uh, you know, I remember seeing a video recently about how it said that famous Shia scholars reject the martyrdom of Fatwa Zahra One yeah. of them was ex-Shia. Another oh. of them was, I think, someone who's just really angry with the Hausa and wants to take his anger out on everyone. A third one of them is one out of hundreds. So why would you pick one and forget all these other hundreds? Oh. Um, so, you know, I think there are people within our communities mm. uh, who, are, um, who, are, who have their doubts. Mm -hmm. And listen, I've got no problem with someone if they've got doubts on, on these issues. Mm. My problem is when they stop listening to what the arguments could be and they just set their arguments therefore in stone mm -hmm. that no one is going to ever persuade me or convince me yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. Because you may have someone who says, well, you know, I found a Shi'i scholar who had certain doubts and then what do you find? And then you find that they don't know about the opinions of Tusi, they don't know about the opinions of others from the earlier scholarship, from the later scholarship. So they hold on to one person and they build their worldview on the basis of that. We can't force anyone to believe. People can uh, reach their own conclusions, but yeah, it exists for sure. Now saying that, uh, this question says, uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum, my name is Fadla from Birmingham. Uh, in the name of Shia Sunni unity, isn't it time to stop discussing Fatimiyah? Let it be so our brethren are not affected. This question, Hundreds of this question, the same question have come in from different people. In the name of Shia Sunni unity, isn't it time to stop discussing Fatimiyah? Well, I think first, uh, first answer I would give is that maybe Fatima al-Zahra salam in the name of Muslim unity should stop, ta should stop or should have stopped making a clamor for a piece of land. Mm -hmm. Didn't she think about Muslim unity? Why did she keep speaking out? No, just sat at home. You're going to heaven anyway. Heaven belongs to you. So why are you speaking out, Fatima? Why don't you think about just keeping the peace? Because your husband seemingly is always made to look like a peacekeeper. Yeah. So why is the wife not doing it? Mm. If you have a problem with speaking out, you should maybe first question Fatima to Zahra السلام, speaking out quite vehemently agreed upon in Shi'i and non-Shi'i literature. That Fatima al-Zahra, as we mentioned yesterday in Sahih al-Bukhari, blatantly speaks out mm -hmm. about a piece of land called Fadak. Why don't you ask Fatima al-Zahra why she didn't keep peaceful? Why didn't you ask Fatima al-Zahra about unity? Why didn't Fatima al-Zahra maintain the unity? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Everybody quotes Imam Ali alayhi salam about unity mm -hmm. or about looking after the deen. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, his wife was outspoken and when she speaks out, she doesn't speak out for no reason. Mm. There's a time and place for a person to sit together 
with their brethren from other schools in Islam, and I'm all for it. It's always the Shia who are begging for unity. True, true. And this is something I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand, that why is it always the Shia begging for unity? In all my years giving majalis, I cannot name more than three occasions when I have seen an imam of a mosque in the UK only. Okay. Who has called <coughs> out that there needs to be <laughs> unity amongst the schools of Islam. Yeah. I remember in Peterborough, there was a mosque there where they have wonderful relations between the Shia and the Sunni community. Yep. I remember there have been a couple of attempts to bring the Shia and Sunni Imams and Maulanas together. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, it's always the Shia who are begging. Mm -hmm. When you're the minority, you may have to beg. But that doesn't mean that if I speak on such an issue, that means I don't want to work together or in tandem with my brethren from other schools in Islam. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, if now there is an event discussing a certain issue regarding you know, the ethical world or discussions of law or mm -hmm. discussions of sociology in British society, no longer am I interested in who's Shia and who's not. Let us all come, sit, discuss. Yep. Because when we're talking to non-Muslims, we're all Muslims trying to represent the religion. Mm -hmm. But this which is being thrown that don't discuss Fatimiyya because it will mean that unity is affected. I want to look at my grandmother one day mm -hmm. and I'll ask her grandma, why is it that you decided that you needed to make a clamor and noise when you could have just sat back, secluded, brought up your children and the Muslims would have been united. Mm. Do you think it's something small for Imam Ali to just leave society for 25 years? What happened in that period after the Prophet died is not, is not something to take lightly. And after being such an integral part of society. Ahsan. 25 years Imam Ali leaves the Muslim community, that's not something I can just gloss over. Mm -hmm. Ali, son of Abu Talib, gives so much to the religion of Islam in his youth. And then all of a sudden, leaves society for 25 years, barring odd appearances. What's taken place? And anyway, there's no harm discussing history. Mm -hmm. God and the Quran always reminds us, discuss what happened with the people who came before you. There are trends in history, learn from them. So shall we stop discussing Nuh, Adam, Ibrahim? Shall we stop these discussions of what's happened thousands of years ago? No, there's no harm. Yeah. Discuss this. The Shia have to come out and be ready to give their narrative without imposing it on anybody. Yeah. I'm not forcing people to agree with my whole narrative, but I've got the sources for my narrative. Yep. You can agree to agree and agree to disagree. Uh, now this question says, Salaam Alaikum. Uh, this question is coming in from Beirut. We have a Maulana in Lebanon who says, uh, what difference does it make whether you believe Fatima died martyred or not? Just follow her path and live her principles. Uh, I think the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family, when he said, Fatima is a part of me, whoever angers her, angers, angers me. me yep. Pretty much made it part of your belief system that if you anger Fatima al Zahra, alayhi salam, in a way you are angering the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because to anger the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family, is to anger Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. That line, that hadith alone for me, is enough for me to show that understanding what she went through and seeing who she is pleased with mm -hmm. is integral to one's belief system. Ahsan Sayyidina. Uh, this question says, Assalamu Alaikum. Sayyidina, you must admit that we don't have many Sahih hadiths about the rib, uh, the door, the slap, the miscarriage. I have someone who is challenging for one and he is non-Shia. They say, all you do is rely on Kitab Sulaim bin Qais. 
Okay, there's about six questions in yeah, one yeah. there. I think, yeah. I think firstly, questioning Sulaim mm -hmm. and who he is, whether it's, uh, you know, the name's a cover name, you know, do we know if there was someone who existed with that name? You can question that all day, there's no issue. But denying that there was a current within the second century that believed this is what took place after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa died, you cannot. So when people come and say to me, you Shia, all you do is rely on Kitab Sulaim bin Qais al Hilali, I as a Shia may turn around to you and say, yes, I could question who Sulaim bin Qais is. But one thing you can't question or deny is that there were a group of people. You could call us whatever you want to call us. You want to call us Shia, you want to call us Rawafil, whatever you want to call us in the middle of the second century. There is clearly discussions about an incident and a confrontation occurring. Mm -hmm. That at the same time when someone comes and tells you that you don't have enough evidence, let me bring all the evidence together. I mentioned in my lecture yesterday, yeah. you'll never ever find the judge telling the prosecutor, give me one proof mm. in this court case. Why? Because a prosecutor doesn't just come with one proof. A prosecutor tries to come with different angles mm. on how this issue emerges. Yes. So for us, when someone now comes and tells you, just show me one Sahih Hadith, although now even this idea of Sahih, most people don't understand what Sahih yeah, yeah. is and so on. But enough for us is that firstly, if we want to bring in all of the documents of history, not only do we have the earliest source that is Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali, yeah. but we have other sources, even in poetry of the likes of Sayyid al-Himyari in the time of Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Kadhim, where they're already talking about the beating and the broken rib. And that's the time of Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Kadhim, mm -hmm. salawatullah wa salamu alayhima. Then we have, for example, within our discussions of the likes of Shaykh al-Tusi, where he says there was no doubt amongst the Shia. At all. At all. In the Talkhis of the Shafi, he makes it clear that there was no doubt amongst the Shia about Fatima al-Zahra's martyrdom. Okay. okay, so here I've given you three epochs. I've told you Sulaim bin Qais. Mm -hmm. I've also gone on to show you how renowned poets in their poetry are talking about the martyrdom. Mm -hmm. I've gone on to a man known as the Sheikh of the Ta'ifa, Sheikh al-Tusi, yep. who is discussing clearly the opinion of the Shia. We can even go to discussions of, for example, Zaydi, not only Ithna Ashari, mm -hmm. Zaydi Shia and discussions concerning this. We can even go to discussions of non-Shia who say that amongst the belief of the Shia, such as Hisham ibn al-Hakam living in the time of Imam al-Sadiq was that they believe in the miscarried baby because of the attack on the door. Mm -hmm. So look how many references I'm giving you. Yeah. All of these references I'm giving you, and, I ha and now you can use non-Shia sources as well, where clearly, as we mentioned yesterday, hmm. the lines, فَلَمَّا تُوَفِّيَتْ دَفَنَهَا زَوْجُهَا عَلِيٌّ لَيْلًا وَلَمْ يُؤْذِمْ بِهَا أَبَا بَكْرٍ وَصَلَّ عَلَيْهَا This is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Sahih al-Bukhari, clear hadith. That Imam Ali alayhi salam buries Fatima Zahra in the night, and that he does not allow Abu Bakr to attend. Yeah. Why wouldn't you allow Abu Bakr to attend? If there is no issue between Abu Bakr and Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, why wouldn't you allow to attend? Clearly Fatima al-Zahra has an issue. Yeah. Something has happened, a clear confrontation. So therefore, when people are coming and asking, well, where is this written? Is it only in Sulaim bin Qais? It's not only in Sulaim bin Qais. Mm -hmm. I could also go to scholars who people have never even heard of. If I go to Karajaki, for example, I guarantee you most people haven't even heard of. Mm -hmm. Let alone going to later sources which discuss the incident of the door. Whether I want to go to, for example, Ibn Tawus or go on to Majlisi, for example. All of these discuss, but people might say to me, okay, these are late. Mm -hmm. well, I've mentioned to you early sources. When I give you an early source, you say to me, but I don't, want, I don't want that source. It's not my problem that in early Islam, there clearly was a ban on writing. You know, when you hear Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, yeah. you always imagine that these are books which were very early. Yeah. Yeah, Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim, they say to you, these are very early texts. These are books that were written in and around the time, let's say with Imam al-Jawad and Imam al-Hadi. But I don't see anyone saying that this is very late. We know that for the first hundred years of the religion of Islam's history, 
there weren't many things being published okay. in the first hundred years. Mm -hmm. The publishing, one may argue, may begin with the end of the Umayyads going on to the Abbasids where there is a flourishing mm -hmm. in the publishing. So one may argue from Umar bin Abdul Aziz onwards onto the Abbasids. Mm. So when someone then tells you that why don't you have a very early source for the incident, I'm like Islamic communities generally did not have an early source yeah. for their history. I ask any Muslim today, biography of the Prophet peace be upon him and his family. Mm. The most important man in the religion of Islam. Yeah. Do we have a book about his life written five years after he died? No. Ten years after he died? You think someone would publish? We knew that the Arabs were not proficient necessarily in writing as much as they were in recording their history orally. Yeah. But we had to wait years before something was published. Mm -hmm. Could have been Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, others pass on to each other. But when you hear these names such as Baladri, Tabari, Bukhari, Muslim and so on, these are moving into the third century mm. and onwards. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, this question here is very interesting uh, because it, made, it got me thinking. It says, Salaam Alaikum Sayyidina, uh, Hussein from London here. Why be patient when Fatima is attacked yet still fight Aisha and not show patience? Why be patient, sorry? Why be patient when Fatima is attacked, yet you still fought Aisha? You as in Imam Ali? As in yeah, Imam okay, Ali okay. Yeah. Uh, and not show patience with Aisha. So why was Imam Ali patient when Fatima Zahra was attacked, yeah. but he still fought? Aisha. Oh, he has an order from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, yeah. that there are three groups he's going to fight. He's okay. ordered. One is, um, we, we normally talk of them, the, the Nakithin and the Qasateen and the Maraqi. There are three groups and he fought them at Jamal, Safin and Nahrawan. Um, so he has an order in relation to after he dies mm -hmm. that if you are able to find a situation where you have enough numbers, go ahead. Yeah. In the issue of Fatima Zahra there was not enough numbers. Uh -huh. In the issue of Aisha, firstly, it's not Imam Ali who fought. They fought Imam Amir al Mu'minin. Mm. Imam Amir al Mu'minin did not want the first arrow to be shot. That was never his yeah. intention. They fought him. They killed a number of his followers. And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib had an order from Rasulullah that there are certain people who break a covenant with you. Mm -hmm. You fight them. And we have this order in our literature. Now, uh, Sayyidina, this question says, Salaamu Alaikum, Aisha fought Imam Ali. Fatima had a confrontation with Abu Bakr. If you say one fought the Khalif of her time, so did the other. What's the difference? Oh, where do you begin with the difference? This is a major difference. Firstly, yeah. Fatima al -Zahra, alayhi salam, with Abu Bakr, only she died. Okay. Aisha with Imam Ali, thousands died. Biggest difference. Mm. Fatima al -Zahra, alayhi salam, Made sure she's the only one who lost her life. Yeah. Whereas Aisha fighting Imam Ali alayhi salam in the battle of Jamal, thousands died. Okay. That's one clear difference. Secondly, it is, there is no hadith that says Aisha is a part of me, whoever angers me, angers me. Whoever angers her, angers me, and whoever angers me, angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. But there is a hadith, Fatima is a part of me, whoever angers her angers me, and whoever angers me, angers Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ta yeah. There is a clear hadith as well. Ali is with the truth and the truth is with Ali. So fighting the truth. So there are clear differences between the two situations without a doubt. But still, discuss them. Yeah. Mm, nothing to hide. <laughs> Aisha fought Imam Ali alayhi salam. Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam rose against Abu Bakr. Openly discuss it and then you go to your grave and be confident about how you face them on the Day of Judgment. Uh, this question is coming in from Finland. It says, Salaamu Alaikum Sayyidina. Do you believe Imam Ali alayhi salam gave bay'ah to the Caliph? That's a tough one. Um, and especially a tough one when you're looking at Shi'i scholarship. Did Imam Ali pledge allegiance? Well, firstly, um, I, I can't deny that there are, you know, there is evidence that Imam Ali alayhi salam pledges allegiance. Mm -hmm. um, 
to the first Khalifa, but the evidences are contradictory in how it happened. I've read one hadith where he does it within three days. I've read another that he pledges allegiance, and this is within you know, non-Shi'i literature, yep. that Imam Ali doesn't pledge allegiance until after Fatima al-Zahra salam died. Now you're a bit baffled here. Mm. If Imam Ali salam pledges allegiance after Fatima al-Zahra salam died, why wouldn't he have just pledged allegiance right from the beginning if everything's rosy? True, true. Why would you have to wait, for example, six months to pledge allegiance? Mm -hmm. Now, in some Shi'i narratives, you have scholars who discuss, there's a sermon in Nahj al which some discuss as to whether Imam Ali is showing that he willingly gave bay'ah. Mm -hmm. there, there are some scholars who believe that he was forced to give a bay'ah. Mm -hmm. The same position Harun found himself with the children of Israel. Yeah. The same position Imam Ali found himself with his community at that time. Um, and we know that a forced pledge in Islam doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So if there was a pledge, it seemingly is a pledge which is forced and certainly is one in the hadith literature where there are contradictions as to whether it was done straight away or whether it was done months later. And if it's done months later, then question marks have to be raised. Thank you very much, Sayyid. And thank you for that first half of this live Q&A session. Join us after this short break where we'll be taking in more of your questions. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Whilst this winter, many of you will be enjoying the festive season, Afghanistan is going through a crisis. Every winter, the weather will reach temperatures as low as minus 18 degrees Celsius. With little finances and homes not adequate enough to keep the heat in, many families struggle during this season. The elderly are vulnerable and physically challenged to fight the cold during these days and nights. Young children, must walk through snow and ice in order to get to school and return to a chilly and bitter cold home. Imam Hussein Development and Relief Foundation are determined to help. We will be providing households with coal to burn throughout the winter. $150 is all we need. $150 will be enough to provide heat and warmth for one household for the whole winter. That's $150 for four months. You can donate via PayPal, bank transfer, or visit us at www.ihdrf.org to make a donation. Help us to spread warmth. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh and welcome back to this live Q&A session with Dr. Sayyid Amman Nakhshawani. Now Sayyidna, before the break we were answering the dear viewers questions. Uh, there's so many of them, uh, I'm just picking the first one that comes in front of me. Uh, this one says, Assalamu alaikum Sayyidna from Denmark. Uh, Fatima's daughter Um Kulthum marries Omar. How could Imam Ali let this happen if Omar did what he did? You know, I, I can't uh, answer the question in in like two or three minutes because this requires deep historical analysis. Mm. And I think that even Shi'i scholarship has their difference of opinion on the issue as to whether Um Kulthum who marries the second caliph is Um Kulthum daughter of Imam Ali alayhi salam and Fatima al-Zahra's marriage or daughter for example, from a previous marriage of a wife of Imam Ali alayhi salam. So is she the daughter, for example, of Asma bint Umayyis, who used to be the wife of uh, Ja'far al-Tayyar, um, and then later marries um, Abu Bakr until she marries Imam Ali alayhi salam. Or is she the daughter of Fatima? I think it can be looked at in a number of ways. Mm. And as I said, you know, having a couple of minutes to answer this question yeah. will not do it justice. Have I met Shi'i scholars who believe in this marriage? Yes. Mm -hmm. What's their argument for believing in it? They say that when the Prophet, in his will, told Imam Ali السلام, that the Quraysh will rise against you mm -hmm. and oppress you and humiliate you, I think that some of those scholars believe that part of the humiliation was a humiliation that he f was facing with a member of his own family. Uh -huh. And that could be 
that particular marriage. The marriage uh, uh, narration is a baffling one. Uh, if you don't let me marry her, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. You know, the second Khalifa is really pumped up to marry her, but Imam Ali has an issue. He has to go to Imam Ali's, uh, you know, has to go towards a family member of the Imam, and his uncle Abbas is alive at the time. And there is even discussions about trying to find out whether she's reached the age of puberty or no. Um, it really requires a thorough discussion. So on one hand, you've got some who might say, if Imam Ali salam lost Fatima al Zahra salam mm -hmm. and he lost his Khilafah, this is another part of the humiliation that the Prophet had mentioned. We may not understand it. For me and you, sometimes when we're looking at history, there are certain things we don't want to accept happened. Yeah. Now there are other Shia scholars who have blatantly denied it. Mm -hmm. who have blatantly said that, okay, Umm Kulthum, there wasn't just one Umm Kulthum. True. There was a number of Umm Kulthums at the time, and it could have been an Umm Kulthum who was the daughter of a wife of Imam Ali, but from a previous marriage, mm -hmm. not the daughter of Imam Ali, alayhi mm -hmm. Irrespective. You're really clutching at thin straws if you're going to use marriages yeah. to try and uh, prove someone's greatness, or to try and cover for acts. Yeah. No one can deny that, you know, the confrontation between the first and second caliph and Fatima Zahra alayhi salam is something that would remain with them forever and until t today the books of history still mention yep. that there was a clear grievance on her part. She certainly did not want them at her funeral. Now, saying that this question is something that's come as a bit of news, n news to me. Uh, it says, Salaam alaikum, I'd like to ask Sayyid Ammar the following question. Did Imam al Hussein alayhi salam ever blame Abu Bakr and Umar for his death as per the following reference, the Maqtal of Imam al Hussein, volume 2, page 34? By Allah, I will remain covered in my blood until I see my grandfather and say, O oh, Messenger of Allah, Abu Bakr and Umar killed me. Yeah, there is a, a discussion on this. I think it's the book, um, Halabi's work, is it Taqrib al Ma'arif? Mm -hmm. Uh, Majlisi, I think, quotes from it about Imam al Hussein looking back while, you know, while on the plains of Karbala and mentioning that I, you know, I was the reason I'm being killed, and he takes it back as far as what took place with Saqifa onwards. Mm -hmm. So it is there within uh, Shi'i literature and possibly highlights that those who say none of the Imams mentioned it, you have Imam al Hussein at Karbala mentioning that what took place after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi died is the reason that I'm um, in this position in Karbala today. It's not far-fetched if one says that Saqifa, the biggest problem with Saqifa is that anyone could become Khalifa. Mm -hmm. All you needed was the right support system at the time. Um, and, 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 and that's how these, you know, these leaders like Yazid and so on, mm. how is it that they become, how is it that they come into power? They come into power because you now have a system of so-called either democracy yeah. or putting your friend into power. And if Abu Bakr could put Omar into power, because you know Omar al-Khattab did not come into power through an election. No. So why can't Muawiyah put his son into power? Uh, now Sayyidina, this question says, Assalamu alaikum, this is a sis, uh, sister from Pakistan. My question is, why is the grave of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, in the same roof sharing with the first and the second? Uh, it's a very simple answer. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, it helps when your daughters are married to the Prophet. So they're going to receive a share of, uh, of the inheritance, a share of his house. Mm -hmm. And so Aisha is still alive after the Prophet dies. She's a widow and Hafsa is a widow. And in Islam, the widow gets one eighth. Mm -hmm. So if my father dies, I'm going to make sure that he is buried here. And if my father dies, I'll make sure that he's buried there. Mm. Problem is, there's, let's say, nine wives of the Prophet. Let's say nine. I don't want to go into scrupulous details of how many. It could be 10, 11, whatever. Let's say there's nine wives. Let's say. If you're getting one-eighth, but there's nine of you, what does that make? One over? 72. 72. 
So then how is it that your father and your father got allotted all of that? What happened to everyone else? And so there are those who will say, for example, that why is it that you know, they're buried next to the Prophet? And then your daughter is married to the Prophet of God. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to have a good allocation if things work out well for you. Yeah. You'd agree? I'd agree. Secondly, being buried next to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, doesn't mean that you're any higher or any lower than anybody else in your time. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is buried thousands of miles away from the Prophet, peace be upon his family, yep. in Najaf. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean that Imam Ali because he's buried in Najaf, far away from the Prophet, is not as high? But well, yes, that's the point. In terms of inheritance, the daughters made sure their fathers were looked after. I said saying that. Now this question says, Salaamu Alaikum, uh, Sayyid Ammar, I converted newly into Shiism because of you in Muharram. I wanted to know how can I mourn Fatimiyah to the best of my abilities whilst living in an anti-Shia household where I'm having to do taqiyah? The very fact that you've, uh, you've asked this question is mourning in itself. I'm mystified, wallah, I'm mystified mm. that there are certain members of even our Shia community who can just sometimes be sitting at home and it wouldn't make a difference to them, Fatimiyya, the way Muharram makes a difference. When the reality is the man martyred in Muharram, if it wasn't for his mom, he wouldn't be who he is. True. His right. mom set the principles of how you stand, of how you speak out of bravery, of valor, of sacrifice. Mm. And wallah, you should kiss your, 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 your parents' hands, kiss your mom's hand, who instilled in you the love of Allah Zahra, because here we have somebody who's telling us that they're a convert and they can't mourn for Fatima. And we can mourn for Fatima. And we find it very normal to be in a household where mom and dad don't even seem like they have a relationship with Fatima Zahra alayhi mm. But for the brother or sister who's, who's sent this question, all I can say is that, you know what, you're amazing, you've come towards the path of Ahlul Bayt, the fact that you're even thinking about Fatima Zahra is is mourning in itself. Uh, this question says, this one was very common. This says, Salaamu Alaikum, in, in the trailer of the Lady of Heaven, there's a depiction of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's face, however, not the faces of Imam Ali Alayhi Salam and Bibi Fatima Alayhi Salam. So is this film permissible to watch since it portrays uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's face? My interesting angle of permissibility of watching this film, now there's a new angle, and that is, you know, having to watch the, you're know, having to see the face of the yeah. Prophet and so on. Well, we've certainly seen the face of a few, a few Prophets and Shi'i productions in the last few years, True. so Nabi Yusuf salam, his face was blatant. I think he became like a major, you know, a major hit. The actor who played Nabi mm -hmm. Yusuf yeah. alayhi salam. Um, and if you refer to rulings, you can refer to Ayatollah Sistani and others, and you'll find that they will say that as long as the person who's playing the role doesn't bring a bad image, mm. you know, to 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 the um, to the infallible um, who they're playing or who they're representing, then there is no harm. So we have within Shi'i jurisprudential opinions that you can have someone who plays the role mm -hmm. of a, for example, Ma'soom. Okay. There may be some who differ. Now this question says, Salaamu Alaikum Sayyidina, I'm Aqib Iqbal from Kashmir, India. My question is that, did Imam Ali alayhi salam used to go to the masjid after Saqifa? And if yes, was he attending the congregation prayer? And how? Praise for your success. I think there's evidence um, that Imam Ali alayhi uh, salam prayed um, amongst the community after the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family died. Mm -hmm. um, he certainly was praying at home, that there's no doubt about, but I do think there is evidence within Shi'i literature. You don't have to go to outside of Shi'i literature. Mm -hmm. There is that famous incident that's quoted by Khalid and Walid, an impossible assassination attempt on Imam Ali alayhi salam. Um, and then Imam Ali foils that assassination. He was certainly in the mosque at that time. Does that indicate that he was in the mosque on other occasions? I think there's enough within Shia literature where you can conclude that. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Now, uh, this question says, Salaamu Alaikum. Uh, various traditions have been narrated regarding the burial of Sayyidah Fatima Alayhi uh, Salaam. According to one, that there was no ghusl to her because ghusl is always for uncleans. 
as Sayyidah being the center of verse of sanctification, there was no ghusl mayyit to her, and it should not be recited through the member. Please comment to it. Oh no, there's certainly a ghusl in our literature. You'll find that Imam Ali alayhi salam gave ghusl to Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. Mm -hmm. Um, there are different uh, laws regarding ghusl for the martyr. If the martyr dies on the battlefield, it doesn't require ghusl. Those who don't die on the battlefield, um, then ghusl is required. Mm -hmm. Yes, and within Shia literature, there's evidence clearly of him and Asma, the daughter of Umayyis, performing the ghusl of Fatwa Zahra Now, as this question says, Salam alaikum, I heard the shaitan congratulates the second caliph after the election. Is that right? I've heard it's written in Kitab al-Hilali. Yeah, there is, a, there is a narration that the first to give a pledge of allegiance at Saqifah was Shaitan. Um, of course, Shaitan can come in the form of a human being. Um, and that can be found within Kitab Sulaim. I do remember also reading, and uh, just on the back of my head, about how he... There is some discussion about how he takes even the form of Mughira bin Shu'ba, but I think uh, that was a while back when I read it. But yeah, there is, there is a Shi'i opinion there um, mm -hmm. that, you know, Shaitan was of those who pledged allegiance. Yeah. Now, the next question says, Salam alaikum Sayyidina. My name is Rashid from Pakistan. My question is, what's the num... Okay, so what is the reference for the hadith in Musannaf uh, of Ibn Abi Shayba to ban the house of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. <laughs> if you just email uh, or just send your email and we will give you the exact reference. I could easily sit here and say hadith number 3425, volume 7. Yeah. In Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba, there's different versions of it. Um, we'll send you the reference, inshallah, with inshallah. a particular publication print here so that you go to the exact one. Inshallah. Yeah. Uh, now, this question says, Salaamu Alaikum. Uh, the will that Sayyid was referring to, uh, what's the source? I would love to read the entire will if available. The will of the Prophet to Imam Ali alayhi salam, uh, Kitab al Ghayba of Shaykh al Tusi. Um, that's where the will is. Inshallah. Yeah. Uh, now this question says, Salaamu Alaikum Sayyid, I have a question. I've always heard the incident of the door was about first of Rabi' al-Awwal. But Sayyid Ammar said in the second lecture, it was 40 to 45 days after. The question is, what Islamic date did the incident of the door and the Shahada of uh, Hazrat Muhsin alayhi salam happen? Or Muhsin? I think... My opinion maybe differs with a lot of Shi'i scholarship. Okay. Um, I believe that there are a number of attempts and a number of confrontations mm -hmm. that happen between the ruling party mm -hmm. and Fatima Zahra salam, Imam Ali Zubair, who were, you know, gathering in the house. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe that straight after Saqifah there was an attack. I believe at the beginning there's a threat, in, or there's a threat to burn. Mm -hmm. A threat to burn the house of Fatima, which I even believe that some... I, there are some non-Shia out there who believe that there was a threat. Yeah. I heard one of them say something interesting. He said, there was a threat to burn the house, but not to burn Fatima al-Zahra, but to burn Imam Ali and Zubair. So it's normal to burn Imam Ali. Why well, doesn't you say to me, Imam Ali is fourth Khalifa, and Imam Ali is going to Jannah, and Imam Ali, and Imam Ali. Muhammad. What they try to do, they try, they try and protect the angle yeah. that when Omar says, we're going to burn, in that reference of the yeah, Musannaf yeah. of Ibn Abi Shayba, they try and say, no, not burn the house. I mean that, not burn Fatima or this. It means that we're going to attack Ali and Zubair if they keep gathering. Because there is, there is a lot of literature which tries to justify even why this is taking place. So you'll have some who'll answer the question, why did Omar do this? They'll say, Omar, you know, gets angry quickly. That's one answer you always hear, that Omar gets angry quickly. Okay. Another is Omar cared for the state of the Ummah. Mm -hmm. So the way he cared is by threatening the daughter of the man who built the Ummah. Uh, interesting. 
And then you have a third opinion, which is an opinion which I remember attributed to Ibn Taymiyyah, mm. where Ibn Taymiyyah says that they had a right even if they didn't, but if they did, they had a right to enter the house of Fatima to check if there's wealth there which could be against the government. And therefore, if you're a government and you know that there are people conspiring against your mm -hmm. government, so you should smash or you should go and investigate. So what you have is, is that it does exist mm -hmm. that there are confrontations, one, two, and I believe that maybe on the third one is the attack on the door. A lot of Shia scholars may say it happens a day or two after Saqifah. I personally believe that no. I think you have to wait a while. I think there's, there is a back and forth certainly taking place. There's a confiscation of Fedek, which I believe was 10 days after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa died. But I believe that you're, you're talking well over a month before there is that final attack and possibly the return of um, Burayd al-Aslami yeah. um, from the expedition with Osama, with the help of Bani Aslam, I think, you know what, when he returns and he blatantly says that I'm not going to pledge allegiance and 80 others are supposedly not to have said, I think then from there the ruling authority goes for one last attack. I yeah. really want to apologize to the dear viewers, there's hundreds, there's thousands <laughs> of questions coming in to the office, to this uh, iPad. Um, I'm trying my best, we're trying our best to get through them as quickly as possible and as best answered as possible. Uh, Sayyidina, this question says, Salaamu Alaikum Sayyid Ammar. My query is that these days young age marriages are highly criticized for obvious reasons like child labor, lack of mental and emotional maturity, etc. And recently I have come to know that Lady Fatima Alayhi Salaam got married at the age of nine years old to Imam Ali Alayhi Salaam when he was 20 years old. Is it true? And if yes, then how can we explain and understand the huge age gap and the very young age of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam at the time of her marriage. That is an interesting question because, yeah, um, she was nine and Imam Ali alayhi salam was 23. Okay. Um, and there are societies where such marriages of somebody who has just become adolescent or slightly older was a norm. There are cultures where it's the norm. There are cultures where people even develop physically quicker than others, environments or climates. And so you even have Sayyidah Zainab salam, when she gets married, I think she's 10 years old. Okay. Now you may find a non-Muslim who might turn around and say, look how young this is. I, I, th mm. I think Mary gives birth to Christ at like 11 or 12 or something. So. Oh, really? You know, if ever you wanted to put pressure on someone, it's by them coming forth with a baby and there's been no man who's touched them. So you had societies where marriages could happen like that. I think there are certain parts of Africa and India, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And I'm not talking about areas where, for example, you would say the girl is forced. But I am talking about certain parts where 13, 14 year old may be more developed because of the climate and environment yeah. to other parts. Yeah. You may even have found that, for example, in certain states in the US, up until 30 years ago, you could get married to somebody and the legal age could be 14, for example. Interesting. But I think this day and age, you know, such things, I believe, can cause oppression, no doubt. And I think, hence you see scholars who don't uh, promote yeah. um, you know, those types of marriages now. But at that time, different times, different societies, I think it was acceptable. There was no hoo-ha, that's for sure. Now this question says, Salaamu Alaikum. Um, I'll keep my question brief. As a young Muslim woman, I'm told I often talk too much about politics and social justice and that I shouldn't do that. Uh, what life lessons can a young Muslim woman tell from the life of Bibi Fatima alayhi salam and the role she played in politics and taking a stand against oppression? Jazakallah khair. Yeah, well, you know, there's, there's so much to look at. And I know that these days there is a major movement mm. to try and understand feminism. And yeah. it's all different forms and definitions, which I do think is something exciting. Mm -hmm. Um... And when feminism normally looks to discuss, for example, people's rights in terms of education, in terms of ownership of property, in terms of inheritance, mm -hmm. in terms of freedom of choice, 
I think that Fatima al-Zahra salam in terms of her political stand can actually be a role model for a lot of ladies out there in the world who feel they have no voice. Yeah. Um, I know the way that sometimes we depict her is more to talk about who she's related to. She's mm -hmm. the wife of Imam Ali and she's the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, yep. without actually saying Fatima is Fatima. Mm -hmm. What Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam showed you is that when you do speak the truth, you'll have very few friends, number one. Number two, it could mean that when you speak the truth, those from your own may be the first to attack you. Mm -hmm. Number three, it's good to maintain the peace for a while, but there has to be a moment where you're unapologetic, when mm -hmm. you could see that people are trampling on others' rights. Mm -hmm. If you take those three as a formula for political activism, that number one, being politically active, may mean that you won't have many friends. Yep. And that number two, sometimes your own are the first to stab you in the back. Mm -hmm. yep. And that number three, sometimes you may have to speak out against the ruling authorities if you see that they're trampling on people's rights. Yep. I think there's enough of a formula there. I think the only difference is that you would have had to have developed a great level of wisdom to know what to speak about politically. Mm -hmm when to speak about it politically. And that political activism doesn't have one way. Mm. You know, people always imagine there's only one way of political activism. As soon as I see you wrong, I had to get a demonstration and shout and make a clamor. No. There are different methods in which a person may be politically active. Mm -hmm. But you need to certainly be listening to the people of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you could end up Raising your voice for certain political issues without understanding the history of the issue. Hasant. I know that people like to use Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. They like to use them as their role models for political activism. Yeah. I can appreciate using them as your role models, but those two, their wisdom means that they don't really require somebody wiser's insight. Okay. Whereas I think in our time, you don't just follow any political movement or current. Exactly. Because you can easily be demonstrating for a cause that you have no understanding of the background of. And it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, you know, the to be ready to speak out against these prominent personalities yeah. um, is definitely a book which someone can take a leaf from. Hassan saying that. Uh, now this question says, Assalamu alaikum saying that my name is Habib from the Dominican Republic. My question is, if someone says to prove that Imam Ali alayhi salam was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the leader of the Ummah, how would you do so without referring to Hadith Ghadir Khum? I think there's a number of instances where, you know, from da'wah al ashira at a yeah. young age, you know, where the Prophet says, whoever accepts me will be the Khalifa after me. Mm -hmm. So from the age of what? From the age of 13 onwards, there's a number of times. You know, when you look at, for example, Ali, you are to me like Harun mm -hmm. was to Musa, yeah. except that there is no Prophet after me. Mm -hmm. If you look at Ayat al-Wilaya, yeah. when he gives his ring away, if you look at Ayat al-Mubahala, mm -hmm. when he is described as the nafs of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and if you're the nafs of the Rasul, there's no one going to be much higher. You're the self of the Prophet. Exactly. But yeah. the most, I think, the most explicit, no doubt, Ghadir, because, you know, you could talk about the word Mawla all day, but when the Prophet says, Alastu awla bikum min anfusikum, yeah. am I not the first in authority from amongst you? And everyone knew what awla meant. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that, that's the most explicit. But there are other occasions where he's, as we said, he is known as the Wasi, the Khalifa. Yeah. He's known to the Prophet like Harun was to Musa. There's in numerous occasions. And, um, you know, I can see that there may be people who have a difference of opinion with it, but it doesn't matter for me. You know, if you can't see Haidar al-Karaz reality, 
you're the one that's got issues. Ah, yeah. uh, this next question says, Salam alaikum Sayyidna, my name is Laith and I'm from Nigeria. I hope you're in good health. I have a question for Sayyid Ammar, uh, which is, did Abu Bakr and Omar seek forgiveness from Bibi Fatima salam Allah alayha, after the attack on her? I think you could see in, um, in, in, in non-Shi'i literature, Mm -hmm. that there is an attempt to come to the house and so that's portrayed as them seeking forgiveness mm -hmm. uh, there certainly was an attempt to come to the house again and you know to say salam and but she in Shia literature she rejects their salam yeah. and she doesn't want to see them and she then says to Imam Ali alayhi salam the house is your house yeah and I have to obey you whatever you decide you can decide they want to come in they could come in but I personally mm -hmm. reject Hassan. Uh, this next question says, Salamu alaikum. Just wanted to ask, why don't we know the exact date that Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam? Why do we have three different narrations of when we think she passed away? We don't even know when her father's born exactly. Sometimes the wilad of her father, 17th of Rabi al awwal. Yeah. Sometimes you hear people saying 12th of Rabi al awwal. Yeah. And sometimes the Shia could say 12th, and sometimes they could say 17th. Wasn't really a writing or you know, publishing house culture at that time. Uh, people would remember things orally. Mm -hmm. And certainly if there is um, a burial which is secret against government orders, yeah. you're not really going to have um, um, much news which documents all of that necessarily at the time. Even Laylatul Qadr, I don't know which night it is. True. And maybe sometimes when Fatima al Zahra is described as Laylatul Qadr. In the same way that we benefit from three nights of Qadr to read Dua, and to gain closeness to Allah, then three narrations for Fatima, yeah. you can never have enough of Fatima to Zahra. Ahsan, Ahsan, that was so beautifully put. Thank you. Uh, this next question says, Assalamu alaikum, uh, thanks for your lectures these past few days. I have a question about Imam Ali alayhi salam. How did he treat the two, uh, the two caliphs after the funeral until their deaths? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is, uh, is a class apart. He's just on a different league to anyone. You want his advice, he'll give advice. And he looks out for the greater benefit of the religion. Yeah. Um, and so he, he is there. If he sees injustice, he'll speak out. Yeah. But he does tend to seclude himself. 25 years, he's not involved. And any expansionism and conquering of other countries that is always mentioned about the first caliphs, he's not involved at all. At all. Major question mark. Why would the man who had Dhul Fiqar not be involved there? Uh, but he certainly does advise um, yeah. those who were ruling at the time, Ahsan. if they needed his advice. Uh, if it no. wasn't for Ali, then I would be perished, one person once famously said. Ahsan, Ahsan. Uh, now this question says, Salaamu Alaikum Sayyid Ammar, did no one of the holy household ever visit the grave of our beloved Bibi Fatima alayhi salam, or would Imam Ali alayhi salam visit in secret? If so, was this ever disclosed? To the children, i.e. Hassan, Hussein. Oh, they, they would visit. They knew where it was and they'd visit in secret. Yeah. Um, but publicly, they wouldn't tell anyone. But the Imams themselves knew. Yeah. Imam al Hassan and Hussein definitely knew. But they, they wouldn't tell anyone. Hassan yeah. Sayyidna. Sayyidna, thank you so much for this QA. So many My questions pleasure. we've got through. I do apologize to the dear viewers if we didn't get through to your question. Inshallah, we'll have another opportunity in the future to get through to them. Uh, but just a personal message from me, this would not have been possible without your support, your help. Uh, and inshallah, we are looking for contributors towards the channel that will inshallah um, leave their mark and inshallah Fatima al Zahra will intercede for you in the Day of Judgment. But from me, from Sayyid Ammar, the whole crew here at Imam Hussein TV, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah Wa Barakatuh. The tragedy of Fatima to Zahra 
was that her and her husband's rights were taken away. Fedek, and even Khaybar, is not a historical event we should just look at. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his holy progeny said that Fatima is a part of me. Whoever hurts her hurts me, and whoever hurts the Holy Prophet hurts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The tragedy of Fatima was that she was attacked. Man aghadabaha, Rasulullah goes straight to that point that he knows that later on there were individuals going to come that they will annoy, oppress, anger Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. The tragedy of Fatima was and remains that we do not know the date of her martyrdom nor do we know the whereabouts of her grave. كانت الأدلة تتراكم عندي بشكل كبير لكن في حاجز نفسي من الانتقال إلى أن سمعت هاي الخطبة المباركة الحمد لله على ما أنعم وله الشكر على ما ألهم وعشت معها تماما كأني حقيقة كأني كنت أقف في مسجد رسول الله حقيقة In recent weeks I decided to investigate this further by having a closer look at the events surrounding the martyrdom of Lady Fatima, while focusing on the sermon of Fedek, which always stood out to me in the Majalis. Who is Fatima? Who is this noble lady that Rasulullah, her father, says, Fidaha Abuha? Join me on my journey as I meet different researchers and scholars to investigate this period in history. Whilst this winter, many of you will be enjoying the festive season, Afghanistan is going through a crisis. Every winter, the weather will reach temperatures as low as minus 18 degrees Celsius. With little finances and homes not adequate enough to keep the heat in, many families struggle during this season. The elderly are vulnerable and physically challenged to fight the cold during these days and nights. Young children, must walk through snow and ice in order to get to school and return to a chilly and bitter cold home. Imam Hussein Development and Relief Foundation are determined to help. We will be providing households with coal to burn throughout the winter. $150 is all we need. $150 will be enough to provide heat and warmth for one household for the whole winter. That's $150 for four months. You can donate via PayPal, bank transfer, or visit us at www.ihdrf.org to make a donation. Help us to spread warmth. Thank you. Shahadat Peygamber Islam ra Quran Kareem ta'abir karde be inqilab dar Islam ma ba'd az shahadat Peygamber Islam war mesho munqalib shod inqilab kamil inqalabtum ala aqabikum awwal kushte siyasi ba'd az Peygamber Khuda shakhs Hazrat Zahra sallallahu alayhi wa Hazrat Zahra shamshir war dashte bude جنگ کرده بودن با اینا حرف زدن مگه جواب حرف کشتنه از از زهر حرف زدن خود به خود شما هم خود به بخورید شما هم حرف بزن اسلام یعنی پیغمبر خدا چیز دیگه اسمش اسلام نیست Sun sets and is silent. There is no one that's patient. As hearts break for this moment, the one who sees Ali aches. Named Haydar by his 